We need to do our induction step from L minus 1 to L. And uh, that means we need to integrate the second line here. We, carry, we need to carry out the TH integral. We need to uh, add the counter term corresponding to the subgraph H and uh, combine the results and show that the result has the desired form, namely the same form, but uh, just with um, the additional graph taken into account. And so for this step, we can really take our two-loop example as a model, and also the discussion that we had in the uh, previous section on these special functions. So you saw that the steps are always twofold. First, we need to prepare the integrand, prepare it and collect all the factors which have the appropriate uh, dependence on the next th variable, isolate all the dependencies in an optimal way, then this might give rise to some functions of these j and j tilde sets. Then we do the integral, and by doing the integral, we get new functions of the j and j tilde sets, and also some extra factors, which are hopefully c infinity, and then we are done. So it's a two-step procedure, essentially, and uh, therefore we have now the same two steps here, and the first step is to prepare the integrand. So the integrand has uh, several parts. It has this uh, C-infinity part, and it has the part which is non-C-infinity in the T variables and depends on the special functions. So both of them need to be uh, treated now, and uh, the order doesn't matter. Let us begin with the C-infinity part. So the C infinity part depends on all the physics variables. It depends on the T's and the beta's. And what we need to do is to integrate over the beta's for this particular subgraph H bar. We need to evaluate the denominator, uh, sorry, the numerator structure. This depends on U derivatives. And we can set the U's for our subgraph. At least we can set it to zero. That is also what we need to do for the next step, because the next step shouldn't depend anymore on these betas and on the use for our subgraph. So there are three things. This integration, and you will see that those special functions have no beta dependence, so the integral, integral over beta just affects the g. Then the z tilde contains derivatives with respect to u, but they also only act on the g. So therefore, uh, we have a separate treatment of this g comma x prime. Then we integrate over the betas in our next subgraph. We evaluate whatever derivatives there are in this uh, numerator, and we set afterwards the u variables for our subgraph to zero. These are three operations. All of them affect only this function g. And uh, what comes out of this operation is a result. Let us give it a name. Let us call it g bar with the same index, g and x prime. I call it x prime since still uh, our graph H has not been completely treated, but it's an intermediate expression. We have already carried out some operations in particular the beta integrals. So that is our first result. What are the properties of this function? We have here a C infinity function in all variables, including the betas, but also the rest. The beta integration is over a compact interval, so after doing the integration, this is still C infinity in all the remaining variables. Uh, similarly, we take derivatives with respect to u. It's infinitely differentiable in u's and also the rest. So afterwards, after taking this, it's still c infinity. And after setting u to any particular value, it's still c infinity in the remaining variables. 
So this still C infinite here and analytic as required. Let's not spell out all the details, but it is analytic in epsilon, C infinity in all the physics variables, but not in the betas and the U tilde H's anymore. Good. Then uh, the special function part, let's call it the F part, or F tilde part. So here we have, uh, first of all, um, these uh, let us collect everything which is uh, non-C infinity in T. And uh, let us realize that here always these combinations appear as we have discussed T times Xi. So here we have always the same arguments. And here there appears the same quantity to the power 2 epsilon. So therefore uh, this should now be incorporated into such a special function. And then we have again isolated all the um, non-C infinity behavior uh, into one single function. So let us define everything which is uh, singular in, in these variables uh, as follows. So what is singular is this, th times psi h to the power 2 epsilon from here. And then all the special functions, product over all the small mi's of the f tilde sub mi always with the same, uh, and I can also put in mu tilde, uh, this has the same two epsilon, then here mu tilde times th times xi h comma epsilon. Okay, so this is uh, the non-C infinity uh, function of the t variable, which appears here in the integrand. Now, what is this product? All these functions are elements of our J sets. If we multiply such J functions, then uh, the result is also such a J function. And here we again have such a J function is out of the same class. And uh, therefore, uh, the product of all of these is yet another element of our J set. We just have to think of what are the indices of the appropriate J set. First, give it a name. This is now a name F without tilde, H. That means it is a, such an F function for our new next subgraph H. So now we have done one step from the previous uh, to the next subgraph. The argument is the same. So, and this is a definition of course. What are the properties of our f that we should highlight? First of all, it is an element of some j set. Now is it j or j tilde? j tilde was the one which uh, may contain a constant. j without tilde is the one which does not contain a constant. So here, this is explicitly multiplied with this factor here to the power 2 epsilon, so therefore, uh, these are if in the numerator always polynomials of this variable. So here there is no constant term. The lowest order term has already this power. Therefore, it's an element of J without tilde. And remember, uh, the logic was always that J are the ones before integration. J tilde are the ones after integration. So of course, we started with J tilde after the last previous integration. Now we prepare the integrand for the next integral and therefore now we arrive at a j. What is the loop number and what is the epsilon power in the denominator? So the epsilon power in the denominator first is equal to the following. So each of these has a certain epsilon power and uh, they are just multiplied. Here there is no epsilon power, so the epsilon power in the denominator is the sum of all these KMIs, right? Now what is the L? The L is the highest degree of the polynomial. So each of them has a certain highest degree in a polynomial and the highest degree was always MI, uh, sorry, the loop number of MI because uh, that was our uh, induction hypothesis. 
So uh, L is bounded by the loop number of this graph. Therefore, this uh, maximum degree is uh, at most the sum of all the loop numbers plus one. So let's say it's equal because it always contains it. So this is one plus the sum over all the loop numbers of the subgraph. And this expression is precisely the new loop number of our new graph LH. So this is precisely allowed. Our induction hypothesis doesn't talk about J functions, but uh, only about J tilde. But this is the right structure which later gives rise to the correct J tilde functions. So this uh, looks very good. It has here the loop number of our new graph. And here in the denominator, it has the sum of all those k's. And they are uh, each time smaller or equal than the loop number. And therefore, their sum uh, is at most given by our LH minus 1. And that is uh, correct um, um, for our J sets. So this looks very good. And of course, each of them was finite if epsilon goes to 0. In spite of these poles here, epsilon over k uh, appears, but the numerators also go to 0. And therefore, this is finite. So the product is also finite, and also for this reason, this function is finite. There was another property of these f functions which was stated in our induction hypothesis. Namely, uh, the function here, not the argument, but the function, the functional form, it depends on the subgraph chain. It depends on the chain of all subgraphs of H. Is that the case? Yes. Because this function now arises as a product of previous functions. Uh, and all of those, by induction hypothesis, depended only on these m's and their subgraphs. Now they are combined to fh. So therefore, this function fh depends on all subgraphs and their respective subgraphs. In other words, this function here depends only on all of the subgraphs of um, H. So it depends on this subgraph chain. This was denoted as X sub H, which are all the subgraphs of H in our set X, which are precisely all the subgraphs of H in our forest of the sector. Okay. So now we have uh, done the C infinity part and the F part. And we have um, uh, dealt with all the factors except for the measure. So in the measure, what appears there? So we have here the mu is dealt with. Then we have um, not yet looked at this omega. So. Um, the omega also appears, so we have this, uh, again, the same combination to the power omega h bar times here xi to these powers over there. And now I said before that this xi for all m is again the same as that. So if we combine the omega stuff, then we get this factor to the power omega h bar plus all the omega mi's. And this sum is the omega h without bar. So the measure combines to th times xi h to the power minus omega h without bar. Then uh, another thing I want to highlight is as follows. And to refer to it later, let me denote it as node d. This is the name of our remark, node d. Let us say we have defined here effectively an operation, like a mapping, an operation which associates to a function g sub g comma x prime. We associated by this operation a new function g bar. Now this operation means integrate over betas, uh, act with it on with c tilde set u to 0. It's an operation. And you can apply this operation to any function. 
uh, which has these variables, u tilde h, beta, and uh, also here uh, you can take the derivative. So you can apply the same operation to many functions, not only to this particular one. So it's a mapping from one function space to another function space. And uh, the point is that this operation would behave in an identical way if you take some other specific interesting graphs. So it would be identical uh, for the following graph. If you take h tilde instead of g, if uh, h tilde is uh, bigger than h. Okay. Because if you take any graph uh, h tilde or g, both of these are now graphs which contain h as a subgraph. If they, and of course, uh, we are always talking about graphs in our sector, in our uh, forest C. This is one bigger graph than h. Maybe as big as g, maybe uh, somewhere in between, but it contains h as a subgraph. Then it has, by definition and by construction, exactly the same variables beta and the same variables u tilde, and you can act on it with this derivative operator. So you can apply this very same operation also to uh, the function, um, let's say, g h tilde, comma x prime. So for such a graph, this function would also be defined by our renormalization procedure. Um, and uh, you can apply to it this operation and it would behave in the identical way. Or you can also take a reduced graph, g over h tilde. You can apply it uh, to g over h tilde, a reduced graph instead of g, if that reduced graph contains h as a subgraph. Can it happen that a reduced graph contains h as a subgraph? So possible. For example, take our h is now really this very big for loop graph. Can it be that a subgraph contains this as uh, that uh, another reduced graph contains this as a subgraph? Yes, it's possible. For example, if you reduce this here to a point, so uh, then this h tilde would be equal to h1. So you reduce our graph by h1, then you get a reduced graph, and this still contains our big for loop graph here. So if something like this happens, then you can apply onto this reduced graph like that one, you can apply the same operation. It contains these variables, it contains these betas, you can act with a derivative, so also then this operation acts in the identical way. So the operation would be identical for h tilde instead of this, or for g over h tilde in, if uh, that is a subgraph. And uh, that is actually a simply equivalent to saying that uh, uh, they are disjoint. So then this is automatically true. So and then you would have here a g, g over h tilde, comma x prime, would be defined in the identical iteration. And uh, Onto this, you can apply this operation and you obtain a result with a bar on it. And uh, the operation going from left to right is the same in each time. So this is a remark for later. Now, we have prepared our integrand. We have prepared our integrand. And let me write it down at the top of the other page. And afterwards clean the page. Then remember before, we had here these three lines and only the last line is actually relevant. The last line is relevant and the other lines are not. So 
So our third line star, uh, it was here, our third line star now becomes, so the loop factor is the same, then uh, the integral dth over th, we haven't changed that, then the mu is absorbed, this is absorbed, so or this has become th times xi h to the power minus omega h without bar, and all the epsilons have been treated, so the epsilons and uh, the rest of the mu is now just f without tilde sub h with the combined argument mu tilde times th times xi h comma epsilon. So this contains uh, the factor here to the two epsilon, it contains the mu to the two epsilon, and it contains all the products of the f tildes. And then the remaining factor is simply g bar, our c infinity part of x prime. And uh, afterwards, we still need to set all the other u variables to zero, but let's uh, ignore this. So this is our star. It has become really simple, and we see the form. I mean, uh, this is an abbreviation, and that is an abbreviation too, but the point is we know precisely the properties of these abbreviations. It is a member of a certain J set. This uh, has analyticity and C infinity properties, and here we have just a T integration without epsilon. The epsilon is fully contained here. So this is now the thing we have achieved. So this is our first step that I always called prepare the integrand. Now we have prepared it, and now we can evaluate the integral. And then we obtain divergences, and we obtain again f tilde functions, and so on. So after cleaning the blackboard, we can now go on with our induction step from L minus one to N. Here this is the third line of our expression that we need to tackle now. And we need to explicitly evaluate the next integral over th, combine it with counterterm divergences, and uh, then see what happens. There are now two cases that we should treat separately. And uh, the first case is the following. In the case where our subgraph H is actually equal to the full graph G. What does it mean? When our subgraph that we treat now is the full graph, it means we are at the end of our renormalization procedure, we are almost done. This is the final step we need to take, and now we need to calculate the last remaining overall divergences of our graph G. They should be local, of course, and then they give rise to an overall counter term for our graph G. In all the other cases where it is not equal, this is just one subgraph, and afterwards we still have non-local divergences and we need to go on. But uh, these two cases are different, and so in particular here, the output should be this counter term for our uh, graph that we are actually calculating, and the divergences should be local and the final Lagrangian and so on. So this is the first case. So just to write down a little bit more explicitly what we have here. So in this case, um, G is actually an L-loop graph. So this is the final step. And it will give us the divergence of R bar of our full graph, which is our bar of H in this case. So, in order uh, to do it, we can specialize. If this is true, then here in the integral, the xi variable doesn't exist, so it's one, because there are no other t's beyond the last remaining one. So then our xi H, which is equal to xi G, is just one. There is no other t for the last t variable. So this is a simplification, therefore this doesn't exist anymore, that doesn't exist anymore. This is epsilon. And uh, anything else? So in, uh, okay, I deleted it, but in this long expression, 
uh, for our next step, there was a first line sum over terms like, and then there was a second line with many other integrals, and all these other integrals in the second line of that expression, they are now not existent, so the second line doesn't exist, or it is one. Our second line in our expression for the cross R of X prime of G is just equal to one, so there are no factors associated to the second line. So this is really everything. So let us treat it. Star is equal to. So if we do the dt h integral, then it will give rise to two contributions, a regular part and a divergent part. This comes from uh, our discussion of general such integrals, and also uh, we have seen it in many examples. So the divergent part comes from taking a derivative, an omega h derivative with respect to t of the integrand at t equals zero. And the regular part comes from taking the integrand and subtracting from it a Taylor polynomial in t up to a certain degree such that the remaining integral is completely finite. And so for the regular part, there is not so much we need to say. We only need to say that uh, it is a finite integral over a C infinity integrand. And therefore, the result of the integral is, of course, a C infinity function of the remaining variables, which are now only the physics variables. So the result is analytic in epsilon and C infinity in the physics variables and the only remaining variables, there are no U variables at all anymore. Uh, so the only variables are all the Qs and all the Ms. And there is no rescaling anymore because uh, we have integrated over the last remaining T and all the other Ts didn't exist already before. And uh, therefore you can go through the comments but um, uh, all these comments are now fulfilled. So uh, this is the essential property that we need to prove and this is proven. So therefore the only thing we need uh, to do now is uh, the divergent part. And that is interesting and um, important. So let's do the divergent part of the T integration. Call it th divergent part. This is equal to the following loop factor c d zero, then times so uh, the psi doesn't exist anymore. Um, and uh, what we now need to do explicitly is to plug in the full result for the function f h. The function f h is um, this uh, typical function with 1 over epsilon to the power k, where k is smaller than the number of loops. But we don't know what it is. It could be 0. It could be up to L minus 1. But whatever it is, it, it uh, exists here. And then in the numerator, we have Cn times argument mu tilde times Th to the power 2 epsilon times n. This is our function fh explicitly, and now we integrate over it. Oh, uh, and um, okay, let's first write it down. Still, th over th times th to the power minus omega h, and then we have here our integrand g bar. And now this uh, sort of integral for any n can be evaluated using our general construction for these divergent parts. Any n has to be treated separately because our construction depends on the exponent of the t. So the construction was take a function which has here a pole, where that is of course a natural number or an integer. Then we have th to some fractional power and a c infinity function. And then the result uh, gives you a 1 over epsilon from this exponent and then the omega h derivative of the rest. So the result is this. 
take um, Cn times mu tilde to the 2 epsilon times n, so that remains divided by epsilon to the k. And then we have this additional 1 over 2 epsilon times n. Okay, so in the uh, denominator, the epsilon power has now increased by 1 from here. Then times 1 over omega h factorial times the derivative d by dth to the power omega h of the function g bar with capital G and x. And all of that can be evaluated at th equals 0. Now, uh, this is of course now interesting because our epsilon power in the denominator has increased. Previously it was up to L minus 1, now it is up to L, the number of loops. As we expect in general terms, so our divergence should be um, 1 over epsilon uh, powers, uh, where the highest exponent is the loop number. So this is what happens here now. Then we have still here these coefficients, cn from our previous function fh, um, and, uh, and the mu factors also still remain. Now, there are several things we can do with this expression. And first of all, let me, yeah, it's not very much space, but let me nevertheless write it down here. So the way we have factorized our result is quite nice. So this is one factor. And uh, the other factor is also of interest. So let me, let me write it in blue. So we can of course write the loop factor inside of the sum. Why not? C D zero. And uh, then, we have a blue factor and we have a red factor. What is the red factor? The red factor depends only on physics variables. Let's say this is a C-infinity function. We take some derivative of it, then it's still C-infinity. We put a variable to zero, it is still C-infinity. So that is a C-infinity function in all the physics variables. Remember that this function depended on our physical momenta first. Let me write it in red. This depended on Q tilde, which at this point, all the Qs are universally rescaled just with our single remaining T variable TH. All of them are treated universally. And now we integrate over H, then, uh, and we know that this uh, function here depends not on TH, because that is the highest T. It only depends on uh, this combination. So, if we take the derivative, then it's C infinity, but it depends not on the combination anymore, but it depends on this uh, by itself, on the physics variables. And when we set t to zero, then what remains is a polynomial. It's a polynomial in the physics variables for the reason that we have discussed already several times. Namely, this derivative acts like a chain rule. So you take derivatives with respect to the tilde variables, so many times, and each time you get a prefactor of the physics momentum or a physics mass. And afterwards you set t to zero, which means all the arguments of that function are set to zero. It's possible since it's C infinity, but therefore you obtain a polynomial in the momenta and masses of this degree times a constant. So it's a polynomial. So the red part here is a polynomial. The red part is a polynomial. In all the Qs and all the Ms of the theory of degree omega h. Let's give it a name. Let us call it P sub h with upper index epsilon. So the polynomial still depends on epsilon in an analytic way. 
it's at the same time a polynomial in these variables, so that means each coefficient of these variables is an analytic function of epsilon. So this is what we have here. Then uh, the blue stuff contains divergences. up to 1 over epsilon to the power L. Because the K was always smaller than L, and now it can be up to L. Now, um, remember that this came from our special function F. The special functions F have the property that they are analytic in epsilon. So even though there is 1 over epsilon to the K, you can take the limit epsilon going to 0, because the coefficients have special relations between them. Now here, the coefficients have changed because we have Cn over n, so the coefficients do not satisfy the same relations as before. Therefore, there is no reason to expect that here the divergences will also cancel, and they don't. This is the origin of the 1 over epsilon poles in uh, the final result. So here, uh, because of this change of the coefficients here, this is just divergent, and the pole in epsilon is really there. It's a 1 over epsilon pole. So there is no cancellation in contrast to the F. So in FH, you also see epsilon to the K, but there is a cancellation. Now, let us simplify the divergences. How can we simplify the divergences? The divergences are here in the blue um, bracket. And uh, as I said, they are really there and they contain still mu. So now you might ask yourself, okay, then apparently the divergences also contain mu, so if I expand this, then I might get from here mu uh, 1 plus 2 epsilon times ln mu plus and so on, divided by epsilon to the k plus 1. We might get here something like also 1 over epsilon poles like times log of mu. Maybe, but actually not. These uh, divergences proportional to L and mu, they cancel. And uh, this is the simplification I want to show. So what is the trick? Let us do this. Insert minus 1 plus 1. Insert minus 1 plus 1 in the numerator, then we obtain the following. So we obtain sum over n. So let's focus on the interesting part. Um, Let's focus on the interesting part. And by the way, I, I should redefine this. The loop factor really belongs to this. The loop factor really belongs to this and not to the special function. So the loop factor belongs here. Then this corresponds to integrating another loop and multiplying with the appropriate loop factor. And this then gives some result, which is a polynomial corresponding to an L loop integral. Okay, so this is a better way to organize it, but of course it doesn't change any conclusion. But now let's look at this. Cn times mu tilde to the 2 epsilon times n minus 1 divided by 2 uh, n times epsilon to the k plus 1 plus Cn divided by 2 n times epsilon to the k plus 1. So it's a trivial identity, but what uh, do we gain? Well, we gain that we can write this as an integral. And remember, these integrals appeared in our discussion of the special functions. So this can actually be written, sum over n very quickly, uh, integral from 1 to mu tilde over dt prime over t prime of the integrand cn times t prime to the 2 epsilon times n divided by epsilon to the k. 
because the integral of that is precisely this function here. So the uh, integration over t prime, where you take into account this, gives uh, the denominator 2n times an additional epsilon power times that function with this exponent without the 1 over t prime. And then you put in the limits and you get exactly this difference in the numerator. So this integral gives that. And so, but here we have now the integral, and let me just do it on the blackboard. This is our special function we started with. This is our function fh. So this is our function fh with the argument t prime comma epsilon. So therefore, this is an integral over a j function, and an integral over a j function gives a j tilde function. We know that because we proved it in general last time. On the other hand, what do we have here? Here we have just explicit divergences. Here we have just explicit divergences, and here in the numerator there is absolutely no epsilon dependence. Therefore, uh, there is absolutely no way that there is any cancellation. In fact, we can write it like this, so that we see that actually we get a homogeneous poly. Uh, just one single term, 1 over epsilon to this power times one constant, which is independent of everything. That is what we have. So this is the divergence. We get a single pole, not a single pole mathematically, but one pole term uh, with one specific power times one prefactor. And then we have here a complicated function of mu but this complicated function of mu is finite. It's analytic in epsilon. There are no one over epsilon poles associated with mu. That is interesting. And by the way, just a, a, yet another remark on this. There exists a renormalization group equation, renormalization group theory. This renormalization group theory wants to take derivatives with respect to mu. Something like this. Now you see, taking a derivative of this final expression here with respect to mu, it's very simple. The derivative with respect to mu just gives back this function fh that we started with from the previous loop, which is finite in epsilon. Therefore, any such derivative with respect to mu does not generate any one over epsilon divergence. This is, of course, used and also assumed in renormalization group theory, but we see it here explicitly. We see explicitly how the mu dependence arises. And it's kind of neat, that's why I stress this point so much. Because at the one loop level, this is obvious. And if you saw my quantum field theory one lecture, then you saw also the argument. Because at the one loop level, there is always a particular combination that appears like a mu to the 2 epsilon times 1 over epsilon plus some finite remainder. This is the one loop structure. And then if you evaluate it, you get 1 over epsilon plus uh, ln mu square plus something finite, which is independent of mu. And so what I always stress is that the coefficient of 1 over epsilon and the coefficient of ln mu square, they are, they are related. And clearly, by this expansion, there can never be a 1 over epsilon times ln mu. But there is always the sum. Here, you see at the general L loop level something similar, even though it's much more complicated. But the structure is, again, you have 1 over epsilon to the k plus 1 poles, exactly those poles times some weird coefficients. And along with that, you have a mu dependence, which is finite. That is interesting. So that is what I wanted to stress in particular. So we have simplified the divergences. So the divergences are just mu independent and have one particular exponent of epsilon. And the mu dependence is uh, split off. It is completely finite, and uh, it defines actually a new function. So this sum over n uh, doesn't exist anymore. This defines a new function, which I will now give an explicit name. Because we know that this is an element of our J tilde set. So let's give it a name, F tilde, um, F tilde A, F tilde H, 
superscript A, depending on O prime and epsilon. And this is an element of a J tilde set with which indices. So previously we had our F with index L and K, and now we have index L and K plus one from this additional one over epsilon pole. And also in general we proved that whenever we start with such a function and integrate, then we get uh, this result. So therefore from the last chapter we also know for sure that this is finite for epsilon going to zero. Let me, however, also give a name for that here. This prefactor is, of course, a number. It is just a number which doesn't depend on any physics. It doesn't contain epsilon. It doesn't contain physics variables. It's really just a number. But uh, let's give it a name. F tilde B, H mu tilde comma epsilon. Okay. And now we make use of the fact that this F tilde may also contain just constants. So this would be an element of F L, J tilde L with index zero. So it's no one over epsilon. And uh, actually all the higher coefficients are also zero. So you could also say it's an element of this. But let's anyway uh, put here L because that is just a subset. And then um, this is an allowed J function as well. It's completely trivial and you might not see the need to introduce uh, such a name for it, but just to systematize our expression, let's do it. Okay, so let us um, summarize what we have on the next blackboard. So this exact... Uh, what we have done was to simplify our expression for the th divergent part. And let me just uh, use the names that we have just invented. And the names now mean that our final result has two terms. Namely, it has this a term and the b term. And uh, both of them represent this, so we can factor it out. So we have fh a. Uh, with the argument mu tilde comma epsilon plus f h tilde b with argument mu tilde comma epsilon times one over epsilon to the power k plus one. And all of that is multiplied with a red factor, which is the polynomial p h epsilon. That's all. And now let me just mention that this uh, function here, which uh, has a mu tilde argument, actually it depends on nothing because it's just the sum. So the mu tilde doesn't appear. I just wrote it for formal reasons. But uh, it doesn't depend on epsilon and it doesn't depend on mu tilde. It's really just a constant. But it's nevertheless an element of this set. And uh, so then this is multiplied with the explicit divergence. This is finite, as we just explained, and this is a polynomial in the physics variables where the coefficients are functions of epsilon, analytic functions. And uh, the full result for our star, so for the final result for our r bar of h, contains also the regular part, which we don't need to write down because it's just an analytic and see infinity function of everything. But that is now interesting. Now, we have extracted the divergence of our sub-renormalized expression. Now the next step is to take, uh, really extract uh, the divergence and the counter term, which will be put into the Lagrangian. So this is then the counter term. The counter term, which can be put into the Lagrangian, is the divergent part of this. Now you would say, okay, this is already divergent, but uh, here there is still this epsilon dependence, and we use minimal subtraction by definition, and therefore we need to minimally subtract uh, this. That means we have to throw away by hand all the higher order terms in epsilon. 
So let's do this. So the counter term is defined as T, this T operation acting on the above result. And then this is of course uh, the following. So this does not contribute because it's finite. This is a prefactor and this does contribute of course. It has uh, a well-defined power in epsilon. Therefore, in order to throw away all the higher order terms, what we need to do is uh, to throw away higher order terms of the polynomial only. And uh, this can be made concrete by using the notation of a Taylor operator. So this is by definition a Taylor operator. which simply replaces whatever comes next uh, by its Taylor polynomial. So, of course, this indicates that we do the Taylor expansion in epsilon up to the order k. So, uh, this is an analytic function in epsilon. Therefore, we can take the Taylor polynomial up to this order, throw away all the higher order terms in epsilon. This is unique, unambiguous. And then if we multiply with that, then we get terms 1 over epsilon to the k plus 1 up to 1 over epsilon to the 1. But we do not get epsilon over epsilon terms or higher order terms in epsilon. This is all thrown away by this construction. And this, my friends, is now the counter term that we should put into the Lagrangian. This is the precise expression for the counter term that we should put into the Lagrangian. Right. And it is a viable contribution for a counter term because it's a polynomial in the physics variables of the desired degree, omega h. It uh, is, of course, a divergent in epsilon times a constant. So it has all the viable properties uh, for a counter term Lagrangian. It's local polynomial degree omega h in the relevant variables, namely mass and momenta of the full graph, and contains up to 1 over epsilon uh, to the L. Why L? So this k is, uh, so we had this sum over terms like, and uh, so each term is like this. And in each term, the k takes some value between 0 and L minus 1. That is what we started with. And uh, therefore, k plus 1 can now be up to L. And therefore, we can have divergences up to epsilon to the L. Then, uh, what is also important, this depends only on the graph. And the sector, okay, we have anyway assumed that this is the biggest graph, but uh, imagine this would be some embedding, uh, then uh, we could say this depends not on the embedding. So uh, what I mean by this is that all the calculation that you need to do in order to calculate the counter term is specific to that graph or subgraphs thereof and the sector, but uh, it has nothing to do with anything outside of that graph. For example, disjoint maximal subgraphs or something else. No dependence on that at all. Everything uh, which enters here in the calculation of the counter term is intrinsic to this graph. And that is important because the counter term Lagrangian can only, defined, can only be defined once. So it must be defined by calculating this graph H in isolation. Then we get one counter term result and that is fixed forever. Whenever this uh, graph will now, um, and its counter term will appear in some much bigger graph, some other graphs in here or there, uh, it's always the same counter term Lagrangian which enters, which comes from this calculation in isolation. And so therefore it's uh, very important to know and to make sure that this result really depends on nothing which the graph itself doesn't know about. And that is the case. 
So this box now proves everything we need to know about our counterterms. The counterterm structure is exactly what we need to have. So now we can go to the renormalized level very quickly. One minus th acting on a bar of h. So we have now calculated uh, this. So this is t of r bar of h, the divergent part of our sub-renormalized graph. And now we can apply this construction. In other words, r bar of h minus its divergent part, which is also the last step in the recursion of the r operation. And uh, that is now, of course, finite by construction because this is the divergent part of that. And the divergent part of this is what we have here. And so if we subtract the two, then we get something finite. But let's just quickly write what we actually get. So we get several contributions, of course. We get one contribution from the regular part. So from here, if we evaluate this and take the regular part, then we get this uh, C infinity and analytic contribution. Then we get a contribution from uh, our function FHA. The function FHA is, um, is, is finite in epsilon, so it didn't contribute to the divergence. So if we do this difference, then this remains. So we get a mu dependence in the final result. Contribution from the FHA which depends on, so that really has a dependence on mu. Um, it has a dependence on mu, but it's finite. And we have the contribution from this difference. Um, and the difference then, in fact, um, concerns these FB terms. And do the FB terms completely drop out? No, they don't, because of these higher order terms in epsilon. So the last contribution is from this difference. So let's say we have this f h b, which is a constant. So uh, this um, is basically meaningless. And then we have from the original diagram, times 1 over epsilon to the k plus 1. From the original diagram, we have just uh, the polynomial p epsilon times 1. And from the counterterm diagram, we have the Taylor operator. So what we get from here is this. And that is not zero. It contains uh, higher orders in epsilon. So all the orders here up to k cancel, which means then the divergences cancel by construction. But everything else remains. So we get uh, overall epsilon to the zero terms. These are constant, and if epsilon goes to zero, they remain and they contribute to the physical answer of our problem. But we also get higher orders in epsilon. So the structure is that this contains epsilon to the zero, epsilon to the one, epsilon to the second, and so on. And in the limit epsilon to zero, there will be a finite remainder from this as well. But we wanted to ask, what is the functional form of the final result? And uh, the answer is, every term that we see here is C infinity in all the physics variables and analytic in epsilon. So this is individually clear from all the terms. And so let's just write it down in summary. Is C infinity and analytic as required. Therefore, at this point, we have proven everything we want to know about the counterterms and everything we want to know about the final result after fully renormalizing our graph. It's just that the induction is not yet complete because we have only dealt with this case, and actually that means that all the intermediate cases have not yet been dealt with, but we have treated the final case using our induction hypothesis as a starting point, and that works out. But now we have to go to the case where h is not equal to g and treat that as well. And that will actually be maybe even easier than this one. You will see it 
uh, we don't have very much to do. Uh, maybe the same amount of um, steps need to be taken. And then uh, after a short while, we will really have completed our induction. Right, so we have just finished uh, the first part of our induction step, namely for the case where the subgraph is actually equal to the full graph. And uh, then we have obtained the final result for the counter term after all sub-renormalizations and uh, for the finite remainder afterwards. And now we do the, the other part, uh, where the subgraph is somewhere in the middle. Do the integral for the case h is different from g. That means h is somewhere in the middle. We have done some subrenormalization of smaller graphs in the set x prime. And then h is our next one, and then there will be some further ones. So that means we need to evaluate this operation 1 minus t sub h acting uh, on our subrenormalized expression r x prime of g. x prime was the set of previously treated graphs, and then h is the next one. So we need uh, to combine uh, the subrenormalized r of x prime, of which we know that one here. This is our interesting part of this object. Then we need to add to it the counter term graph with the counter term for h. And we need to carry out the th integration and hope that this will be finite and uh, can be brought into the form that we need for our induction. Let us begin by structuring what we need to do in a similar way to here. Because here, uh, in the simpler case where the, we treat the full graph, in the end we had three contributions namely from uh, the divergent part of the t-integration and from the regular part of the t-integration. Okay. And here we can do something similar. So we get contribution from the original graph when we carry out the th-integration. So the structure is, uh, let's say, star. So this for the full... Um, uh, Subrenormalized graph, and then let us take the DTH regular part. Then we get from the TH integration the divergent part. And then we have the counter term from this, let's call it TH acting on star. Whatever that means precisely. Okay, but we have for sure these three contributions. And then, of course, what we might hope is that uh, these two should combine to give something which has no subdivergencies anymore. And that means if we combine the t-integrations at least, then the result from the t-integration is finite overall. And then there will be some other later integrations which are not finite yet, but uh, at least the t-integration from the combination is finite. And also this t-integration by construction is of course finite. So and then we have each term uh, two separations, and each of them is uh, finite on its own. And then they, that must be brought into the form of our claim, okay. with factorization into these f functions and the g functions, which are c infinity. All right, this is the structure. And uh, let us give some names. So the regular part, let us call it uh, part 1. Then the divergent part of the t integration is part 2. And then the counter term is part 3, in the same order as we did it before. And now we can uh, start doing it. And um, I would change a little bit my plan here since we have now discussed the counter term. So that means we have discussed explicitly our value of t r bar of h. And that is precisely what enters here. 
This is the precise uh, counter term uh, which also enters into the Lagrangian which we need to use here. And so we now know everything about the counter term and how it has arisen from the calculation. And uh, having this in mind, we'll uh, simplify our discussion of these two items. So let us begin with these two items and uh, do the cancellation. And afterwards, we retreat the regular part, which is uh, also very easy. So let me um, begin. Let me begin with writing down an explicit expression for this uh, object number two, which is the divergent part of the T integration from here. So this contains um, loop factor times the T integration times the measure factor times the f sub h, which depends now on this combination. times g bar, which depends on the subgraphs which have already been treated. Now, as I said, uh, we have just five minutes ago dealt with a case where uh, this is actually the full graph, but the integral was the same. So the integral was the same up to the appearance of the xi. So the xi is now new, but it, this is just a factor which doesn't really affect the procedure of the integration. Therefore, we can first of all factor out this xi here. Xi completely factored out of the integral. This does nothing, and then the remaining integral is the same as before. But before we had just mu tilde times t. Now we have mu tilde times xi times t. Therefore, the result is the same as before, just with the replacement mu by mu times xi. So whenever we had mu before, or mu tilde, now we will have mu tilde times xi h. That's all. And so I can directly copy the result, and here is the result. So this was our previous result for this star. Um, with, uh, sorry, uh, no, at the top of this. This was our result, star, uh, th divergent part from uh, the case where it's the full graph, so that's it. And so this is just the same, only we need to replace uh, mu tilde by the product. So we can copy it, and this factor is in the front. So uh, that's it. And we get the, uh, okay, the only difference is that here we don't get the polynomial because that was specific to the subgraph, but all the treatments of the f is identical. So we get f h uh, a, and uh, excuse me, I just see here that I forgot the tilde, so previously I should have put here a tilde, because these are f tildes, also here f tilde. And here as well, f tilde. Um, and the argument is now mu tilde times xi h, comma epsilon, plus f tilde b h, which has really no arguments, but anyway, times that. And all of that is not multiplied with this polynomial, but with the counterpart for g. And that polynomial was really uh, just the derivative of the g function for the graph h, and now it's the derivative of the g function for the graph g. So, uh, literally, we have here d by dth to the power omega h applied onto the g function, g bar sub g and x prime for the previously treated subgraphs. And in the other case, we had here only g h, and that was the only difference. And that has to be applied 
in the limit uh, th equals zero. Good, that's it. And so here we have the prefactor, which is now known, a finite function of mu and a divergent function in epsilon and the derivative of a g function at t equals zero. And now comes the new step, uh, which you expected all the time, namely we apply proposition d. Here we can apply proposition d. on these derivatives and the proposition told us that any such derivative of a g function for a full graph can be as usual rewritten into derivative of the subgraph inserted into the g function for the reduced graph and this holds now also for g bar and I will just give a comment um, in a second but let me first write the result. So this is psi h to this power and I forgot the loop factor here. Let's put the loop factor here, ct0. And then we have here fha with the arguments plus fhd times 1 over epsilon to the k plus 1. And then uh, proposition d tells us that we get this times the following factor, u h, uh, sorry, xi h, to the power plus omega h, times the insertion operator, u h, and the argument of this is now the same as that, but with the subgraph h. But the same as that with the subgraph h is nothing but our polynomial p epsilon that we defined five minutes ago for the, uh, the other case. So this with subscript h is just this polynomial. That's how we defined the polynomial. And this now is an insertion operator which acts on the reduced graph. And the reduced graph has now a g function g with a subscript g over h, comma x prime over h. So this is a g function without bar for the reduced graph uh, and for this reduced a subsector of treated graphs as we defined it initially. And now let me just say this proposition D applies. Why does it apply? We know from the induction hypothesis that it applies for lower order graphs and for lower order x primes. So x prime with fewer graphs inside. Then it applies. And uh, However, now we have not applied it exactly to the thing that is in our induction hypothesis because there we have the g without bar. Does it also apply? So literally it would be true if we have no bar. Then it's literally copied from the induction assumption. But now we have a bar. And does it apply also with bar? Yes, it does because going from bar to uh, non-bar to bar was this operation where I said the operation is identical um, for G and for a subgraph H. So let me write this down. This is this node that I called node D. That's why I called it node D. So G bar subscript G and G bar with subscript H, they are obtained by literally the same procedure. Namely, by which procedure we integrate over betas. This has no interference with taking derivatives with respect to T. So we can take derivat uh, integration over betas before or after applying this proposition D, so nothing changes. Then uh, the procedure was to apply uh, Z tilde operations. That is derivatives with respect to U, but for that anyway, the proposition D was formulated, so we can do that before or after. That doesn't matter. And then it was also setting U to zero. That has no interference with the validity of this lemma. Therefore, um, we can really say that it applies directly also for the G bar functions and then we have this statement here. So that is now our um, second term star 
dt integral evaluated, but taking only the divergent part. Now we have reduced it to an insertion of the uh, counter term subdiagram, essentially. Not quite, but uh, we have brought it into a form which can be connected to, um, to the counter term diagram there. Very good. So let me contrast this with uh, the result for three that just fits here, and then we have to add the two on the next blackboard. So three has the same measure. And as we said in the beginning, this is this magic of uh, writing the measure in this different way. So also uh, this so-called second line in our three line expression for this, uh, the second line with all the other integrations, that is the same for um, our full graph and for the counter term graph. Then there is one factor here now, uh, xi h to the power minus omega h and the insertion of the counter term, u h tilde, and now the insertion of the counter term is minus t of r bar of h. This is the insertion of the counter term. And this is calculated in isolation, or in other words, we take the result from uh, over there. And this is then inserted into our reduced graph, which means this has a g function, g of g over h, comma, the appropriate subsector, psi prime over h. And this is, of course, the same g function that also appears here. Now if you wonder, I wondered uh, a bit about this prefactor here, so you can look at examples where you understand uh, the precise number of xi factors that appear here or there. Uh, the best way I, I can explain it in generality is the following. So the measure that we have magically rewritten uh, contains all these omega bars. And the omega bars for the full graph are now in one case uh, different from the omega bars for the uh, reduced graph. Namely, there is one uh, subgraph, not this one, but some other subgraph in that graph which contains this counter term, right? We have now a very, very big graph that is shrunk to a counter term and then this counter term is inside some smallest subgraph of the bigger graph. And then for that particular next biggest graph, which contains this counter term, the omega bar is changed by the degree of divergence of this counter term. Because that is now a vertex in that count in that uh, subdiagram, while in the full diagram this is not a vertex, but it's a subdiagram. Therefore, this particular omega h bar is changed by exactly this amount. So this is how I can explain this factor. And now let's uh, clean the blackboard and write down the sum. So let's write down the sum, two plus three, which means we take the divergent part of our integral from the full diagram plus the counter term diagram for the subloop, and we obtain this. Just combine the last two equations. So we have this common factor, psi h to the minus omega h. Then uh, this counter term is the thing I just deleted. It contains, of course, precisely the same f functions here. Uh, actually, it's not quite, but it contains the same fb. It doesn't contain the fa, but it contains the fb, which has no arguments, which is just a constant. Uh, therefore, it is the same for the counter term and for the full graph. And so I can just write everything like this. Um, psi to this power. Then uh tilde and put everything inside of the insertion. So I can also do this in the upper equation. So then we have a big insertion. By the way, this combination is of course u tilde, u tilde h. So, and then I can put this inside of the insertion because that is just a factor. And then we have overall a big expression. And at the end of it, 
we have the polynomial p epsilon uh, of h because that appears everywhere and then we have the following. So from our equation two, we have the two f's, fa, with its argument h tilde plus f h tilde b times one over epsilon to the k plus one. And then from the counter term, we directly have minus the same f tilde b h times one over epsilon to the k plus one. But here in the counter term, the single difference is that we have the Taylor operator, which annihilates the higher orders in epsilon. That's all. So that's the single difference. So that is really all uh, possible to be combined. And then at the end, this acts on g, g over h comma x prime over h. So that's it, and so we can co of course combine it. So this is psi h to the minus omega h times u tilde h of uh, f h tilde a times the polynomial plus f h tilde b. And now we can write it like this as a fraction, one minus Taylor operator divided by epsilon to the k plus one acting on the polynomial. And now you have a sum of two terms and each of them is finite. This is a finite f tilde. This is a finite polynomial with higher orders in epsilon. This is a finite f, which is actually a constant. And this has a divergence, but it's cancelled because here we subtract all the first k epsilon powers. Therefore, it starts in the numerator. It starts at epsilon to the k plus 1 and cancels fully the divergence. So from here, we get something finite, epsilon to the 0 plus higher orders in epsilon. And all of this is then inserted into this uh, reduced loop function. Well, and then we have it because what we needed to show is that after we do the th integration, and now we have done it, we obtain something which has uh, the form of products of f's or f tildes and c infinity functions. So now we simply have to ask ourselves, is this a product of f tildes with the correct indices and c infinity functions? And that is the case. Here we have an f tilde with the correct indices because uh, the correct index for our L loop diagram H is, uh, this is an element, we said it before, of J tilde L and K, where K is smaller or equal than L. And L is the loop number of H. So this is exactly a function of the form which is required by our induction. And this as well. Then we can factor this out of the U insertion. Doesn't really matter. But anyway, what remains is then an analytic function in epsilon and a C infinity function in the physics variables, which is multiplied or inserted into that, which is also C infinity in all our correct variables. And therefore, the combination of this has uh, the form that we indicated, namely sum of terms like f tilde times g. So then it's a sum of two f's uh, times uh, the respective g's. So here you also see how the structure of sum of terms like arises for the first time. And the new g's for the next graph are then combinations of this p epsilon inserted into that. That will give a contribution to our new g. So each term has the form of, um, or let's say, this has the following form, psi h to the minus omega h times a sum. And now I would say, um, let's call it uh, J, 
equals either a or b to make it very explicit and then we have fj tilde h times g superscript j with index g comma x. Now that means that we have these two f functions a and b they have the right properties and uh, this defines now two contributions to our next uh, induction step. Now we have finally the set x here and we have the full graph g here and uh, there are two contributions a and b. And just to make it explicit, the contribution a means we take this insertion of that polynomial and act with it on this. And the result is a C infinity and analytic function in the physics variables and epsilon. And it will be called like this with index A. Then the second thing, you take the polynomial, act with it by this operator, which is finite in epsilon. Then you insert it into this graph and it, this gives you your contribution with index B to your new induction step. And again, this is of course C infinity and analytic and epsilon and the physics variables as desired. And it contains the correct re rescaled variables because th, the variable th doesn't exist anymore. So therefore, um, the physics variables now do not appear anymore in these previous tilde variables which include the factor th. But uh, what happens, we have taken some derivatives with respect to th and so on. Therefore, uh, the same physics variables would now appear uh, with all the factors but without the th. So this has exactly the right properties that we want. So this completes our induction step for this contribution here. Very good. As I said, it's not very complicated now. And so now we just have to look at the uh, remaining contribution, one which is from the regular part of the T integration. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the regular part, let's try to squeeze it here, or let's start here. So, but first of all, let's put this into this frame here. So this is an important intermediate result. So we have found two contributions with the announced properties. So for this, the induction step is complete. Contribution one is the regular part of the T integration. And our integral is the one in the box at the top. So now let's do the regular part of the T-integration. Loop factor times dTH over TH So it's the same as above, but now we take the th regular part, which means by definition that we uh, have to uh, do the th integration and the replace the integrand by definition by uh, itself minus its Taylor polynomial in t to the appropriate order such that the integral becomes finite. That is the definition. But in order to um, do the integral over t, we need to separate the t dependence from the remaining dependence. And here, that is easy because we can factor out again this factor, which is actually welcome. I didn't stress it, but this factor is also part of our induction hypothesis. So this is good. And uh, so that is okay. But here we have a mixed dependence of our singular function f on this product. And so here we now apply what we announced last time, namely we separate the variables. We separate variables 
um, and separate out the dependence on th so that we can do the integral. And uh, we separate from that the dependence on the remaining variables. And that is possible because we have proven an appropriate property of those f functions. And this can now be applied. So we separate variables. And remember, when we had the property that such an f, which depends on a product, can be written as a sum of several f's, and each of the f's then depends only on one of the variables. And we call them f1j, f2j, and so on. So it looked like this sum over such terms. And then one of them depends only on t, and the other one does not depend on t. So the one that does not depend on t can be pulled out of the integral. Then after we have pulled it out of the integral, we can rename it. So f2j would become fh tilde. Let's call it fh tilde superscript j. Why not? Then it looks like this. Then we have now a sum over this uh, j. And the first term that we get is uh, the xi, xi h to the appropriate power, which is desired, as I said. Then this uh, fh j, which uh, does not depend on t, so it depends on the product mu tilde times xi h comma epsilon. And that can be pulled out of the integral, and then comes the integral dth over th, um, then here th to the minus omega h. Then the remaining f, f1j, as it was called, which only depends on th and epsilon. This is this factorization. And uh, then the rest. Loop factor ct0 times g bar function of g and x prime. Okay, do we now have the structure that we want? I think we almost have our structure because by our property from the last time where we proved that factorization, we have now obtained a function. It is called f because in our property we called it f and we know it's an element of this f set, uh, sorry, of the j set with the appropriate indices, but a j set is always a subset of a j tilde set, so we can say that this is an element of j tilde j tilde with which index, so this factorization always kept intact the loop number. So this is an element of uh, j l k. k is smaller than l, and l is the loop number of our graph in question. Then the factorization gives us this, and here it gives us some index k j, and we know that the sum of the two indices adds up to this k. Well, it's not so important. What is important is only that this kj here is smaller or equal than the previous j, k, so this is smaller than l. And therefore, this is an allowed element of our j tilde set. Actually, it doesn't even exhaust the possibilities because uh, the j tilde allows for k equal l, but that doesn't appear here in the calculation. But this is allowed. And this is, again, already something which is perfectly in line with our induction. Our induction wants that we can write our result as this psi to this power times an element of this set, which we have, times something which is C infinity. So the only question that remains is, is that here C infinity? And of course, we have to take the regular part of it. And then it is the infinity. Note, here we have this non-C infinity function of the th integration variable. But even though it's uh, not C infinity at t equals zero, everywhere else this function is also C infinity in th. 
And not only that, uh, by definition, this TH regular part subtracts from that so many Taylor coefficients that overall the integrand behaves like uh, at least a constant or a t to some power, to some positive power. So therefore, this remaining t to the epsilon dependence from here, where epsilon is um, not infinitely large, but uh, we expand around epsilon equals zero. So in some region for epsilon around zero, let's say epsilon smaller than one half or so, or smaller than one in fact, uh, for all these epsilons, the integrand is bounded and continuous down to um, t equals zero. So if we integrate, then the result is c infinity in all the other variables, which is what we want. And therefore, we can directly say, let me write it in red again, this part here defines a function, defines a function which depends on the index j, and this is then g subscript capital G and x with superscript j. This is one viable contribution to our final result. And so we have it once again. We have again written our result of this part one as the desired prefactor times a sum of terms like f's in the correct set times g's with the correct variables, of course, and the correct C-infinity and analyticity properties. That's it, my friends, once again. So we have done it. We have achieved our induction. That's all. Maybe we just write some words. But uh, that is the all, all the steps that we need to take. Let us write some words. So this is the desired form for the induction. These newly defined functions are g, sub g, and now the full set x, including our graph h. These are c infinity or analytic in all the relevant variables, or the announced variables. Again, uh, the re rescaling happens for the uh, Q tildes which previously depended on TH, they now only depend on Xi H and not on TH anymore, which means they have been re rescaled. So this is the appropriate set of variables. And in all the variables, it's analytic or C infinity in view of this uh, integration procedure. Then you see that uh, automatically, uh, this sum of terms like exists and arises. So, but it's not just a random arbitrary sum which we have no control of. It's a very specific sum. It's a very specific sum. And uh, this sum here arises because we need to apply our factorization property on the previous FH. The previous FH is a very specific function. As we stressed before, it is a function which depends on the subgraph chain of H, not on the embedding, but only on the subgraph chain for H. And this has a certain factorization property, and therefore all these Fs and uh, those Fs which appear in the final result, they are derived or um, inherited from uh, the previous f. So also, there, therefore, all this set of these fh's with, sorry, with tilde, let's, uh, let's call it tilde, let's call it tilde. We don't have to because it, it would be an element also of j without tilde, but let's uh, say it's an f tilde function because that's what the induction requires. So these f tilde functions are specific functions uniquely determined by the factorization of that uniquely determined previous f. And therefore, any of those f's here depends again on the particular subgraph chain of H, as we required. So any of these f tildes, 
There are many of them, but each of them is characteristic and uh, depends only on the subgraph chain. Which we may call x uh, sub h, which are all the subgraphs of h in x. Um, and that is by construction. Therefore, we have proved also this property, and so if you collect it, then I would say we have proven practically all our comments, so all the comments belong to the induction. And each comment has been established. So this property of the Fs is established. They have are in the correct sets. They have the correct properties. Uh, the properties of the Gs are established. We have the sums of terms like. We have the, this factor here. And uh, then the rest is the integration measure from the second line in our three-line formula. And that is totally uh, in agreement with what we need to prove. Therefore, we have established um, our induction, but not quite. Sorry for this uh, misleading statement. So it sounded maybe like a summary, but we are not yet at the end. But we have established all properties that we need for the Fs and the Gs and for our formula. There is one tiny detail that I would like to explain now as the final thing. And that is this proposition D. As I stressed several times, this proposition D needs also to be established uh, iteratively, order by order. At least I think that is the nicest way to establish it. We have used this proposition D various times here, uh, in fact once, namely over there. And uh, the way we used it is exactly the same as we used it in several examples before. Therefore, uh, we need to make sure that at the next loop level, this proper proposition D also holds with the appropriate functions. That means we need to show that those functions that we have now constructed, these new Gs with our set X, they should satisfy this proposition D as well. Just like the previous Gs with X prime satisfied our proposition D. That is now what we need to do. And only if we manage to do that, then the next step can work and then the induction is complete. But uh, that is really something technical, however necessary, uh, that we need to fix now. So let me clean the blackboard and then let us think of that. Uh, actually, maybe uh, before I clean the blackboard, let me write down one remark. Note. D. There was already a previously a node which I called node D, and now this is a, a copy of the previous node D. Namely, we have now again defined an operation, an operation which brings us from our function G bar x prime to a function G non bar of x. And there are actually many functions which we obtain from this. So we have an operation g bar g comma x prime is mapped to many functions g, g comma x without prime and then with superscript j. And actually there are uh, how many functions are there? There are these functions here, which we define from the regular part of our TH integration. There are many of them because we needed to do the factorization of the F function. Then for each term in the factorization formula, there is now one G function. And this arises from this integration. So it's an integration, like a convolution, where you convolute the G bar with such a function and with a T integral in a regular way. This is one set of functions, but then previously for our counter term, uh, we also had some functions. So here we defined, uh, here it was, actually here, very good. 
So here we define two functions, GA and GB, capital A and capital B. And these were defined by taking that reduced graph operation and inserting into it something finite related to the polynomial of the counter term. So these are separate operations. So here the operation of G bar is this. You take G bar, then you to do the derivative with respect to th at th equals zero, and then uh, you obtain a result and ob uh, obtain uh, your your expression. Uh, okay, let me say it in a better way. Uh, it's probably better to go from here to that. A and B, and then the operation would be replace G by G over H, and then insert into it this object, and then you obtain your result for the next level. So we have two operations, and now we can ask again, are these operations identical if you replace this G by some other graph? And of course they are, again, let me just write down the text. This is identical. for G either replaced by a graph H tilde if H tilde is still bigger than our graph H. Okay? Because what we have done only depends on the fact that our big graph G contains our graph H. So H is the next graph to be treated and uh, G is a bigger graph so there is something in between. And so uh, how much bigger the graph is doesn't matter. So you can take any graph which is bigger than H, and here we have taken some graph H tilde which is bigger than H, and then this operation happens in exactly the same way. You can also here have a G H tilde divided by H, insert that, uh, it gives exactly the same kind of structure. And here, of course, as well, you take the G bar for um, an intermediate graph H tilde, do this convolution, you get some result. So the operation is identical. But it's also identical if you take, instead of G, you take a reduced graph, G over H, if that reduced graph contains our H. Okay. And uh, this is equivalent to saying that the reduced graph has no intersection with our graph H, as we discussed already before. So also then, the operations are identical. And so this will now help in uh, establishing our proposition D. Actually, now the proposition D is more or less obvious, but let me write down the text so that it uh, hopefully really becomes clear. Okay, so we only need to establish our proposition D as part of our induction step. And for that, we essentially need this node D, as I called it. So let me write down what we have. Our induction assumption. Is we have to take some later graph. H tilde which is not inside of our set of treated graphs X. And then from our induction assumption, we know that for uh, the set X prime, uh, this proposition D holds. So that means I can write literally what we have in our assumption, D by DT H tilde to some omega set H tilde, some differential operator, then G of our graph and X prime, the previously treated graphs, evaluated at TH equals zero. For that we know what is the result because of our induction. So that must be 
psi h tilde to the uh, omega h tilde. Okay, let's put here omega h tilde for consistency. That could be any number. Then u h tilde insertion of the same derivative. Z h tilde g h tilde now. So the subgraph, this h tilde is a bigger graph than our h, but it's still somehow a subgraph of the big graph g. And then we have here h tilde. And here we need the sector or the set of treated graphs x prime uh, intersection with this h tilde in quotation marks as we have de defined it before. So and then this acts on the reduced graph g reduced by h tilde now um, because we applied this proposition on h tilde and then uh, comma x prime uh, over h tilde. Okay, this is what we know. We know it with x prime here. And the only thing we need to do is to prove the identical equation if we remove the prime. That is what we want. And uh, removing the prime means that we need to go from our previous g functions to the new g functions. And there are two operations involved, namely once we go from g to g bar of x prime. For that we have already shown that this proposition d still holds, so for the g bar it holds. And then there is another operation going from g bar to the new g's. And this operation is complicated, it involves integration over th and so on, but it's identical if we do these replacements. And that is now the only thing we need to know. And so it's just a matter of looking at the formulas in the appropriate way and making use of these two things. And there are two cases. One case is that H tilde is a bigger graph and not equal to our graph H. So remember, it's a later graph. But later graph can mean two things. It can mean this. Or it can mean that it's disjoint. Both cases appear. So after our graph H is treated, we can treat a bigger graph where H is a subgraph, or we can treat some graph somewhere else in the graph G. So these are two cases which we need to consider. And so let's consider them. So let's consider first this uh, object. And now we can see here uh, what we have written. So this operation, if we have some graph like this, h tilde is bigger than h, then our operation going from uh, x prime to x is identical for g and h tilde. So that we can use. So uh, we have here some operation, g, and we act with some operation on it. And this operation happens in the same way if we uh, do it for h tilde. So that means immediately. So you can take this equation here, you integrate and uh, integrate over betas, set use to zero, and so on. Uh, these are the operations that we do. Uh, do this convolution integral with the f's over lower order variables. So this is no of no interference with uh, this equation here. So before and after this operation is done identically on the left and right hand side, our equation still holds. And then we have shown that it holds for x instead of x prime. Let's just make this a little bit explicit. So the operation g x, uh, g x prime going to g bar x and uh, x prime and then going or going directly to g uh, with g and x without prime with these indices j or a and b, there are all these different possibilities, is the same as for g h tilde comma x prime going eventually to g h prime comma x uh, with the appropriate subsector of course. 
And uh, so on the other hand, So that means uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side here we apply the same operation. That looks very good. But then we also need to ask what happens to this factor here when we go from x prime to x. So this is a, a, a function for this reduced graph which we know not so much about. And uh, the treated graphs here are these x prime over h tilde. Afterwards this function would also change but do we know how it changes? So uh, we also need to go from x prime to x here, but we have not said anything about this function. So let's think of this set here, x prime over h tilde. So this x prime over h tilde, it is actually the same as x over h tilde. Because what is this definition here? The definition uh, of these reduced graphs is you take any element of x and reduce it by h tilde, which just means that if your graph here is a subgraph of h tilde, you uh, eliminate it from the set. And so since our h is now a subgraph of h tilde, so if you add to this set, you add h, then this is also just reduced to nothing. Therefore, this reduced set doesn't change. And so let's write it in words. Uh, because these are all the elements in x or x prime which are disjoint from h tilde. So we said this before. We had this notation. It was originally in quotation marks. So this is not a generally defined operation. Dividing a set by some graph which is uh, actually not an element of the set. So in quotation marks, but we define precisely what it means, and it means all the elements in this set which are not uh, subgraphs of that. And uh, so this doesn't change if we add another subgraph. Therefore, this set doesn't change, and since it doesn't change, this function doesn't change either. And then we are done, because then before and after x prime and x, this is the same, and uh, the prefactors change in the identical ways on the left and right hand side of the equation. And therefore, for this case, we have established our proposition D also for the next step, which is very important and very good. So let's write it at the end. But now let's uh, look at the second case where uh, the graphs are disjoint and then basically the opposite happens. So the opposite happens. Let us start also therefore in the opposite way. So this. Um, set that we need there, uh, that we need here. This is now the critical thing. So this set x uh, intersection with h tilde in quotation marks, um, that was the um, any element of x and take the, um, the subgraph of it which is inside of h tilde. So this is now the same as uh, x prime intersection with h tilde because h tilde is disjoint from h. So whether h is inside of x or not doesn't matter since it's disjoint from h. Therefore this intersection doesn't change. There's nothing new in the set. So let's write it explicitly. These are all the elements in x or x prime which are subgraphs of h tilde. And so h is not a subgraph of h tilde, therefore nothing changes and therefore this set is the same. Therefore we can say immediately before and after going from x prime to x, this function will not change at all. This function will not change at all. On the other hand, this is now uh, dealt with by this remark. Yes, we now have a graph g divided by h tilde and this g divided by h tilde, so h tilde is somewhere else in the graph from our beloved subgraph h that we treated. So h is somewhere else, therefore h is a full subgraph of this. So in our example, just to fix an example, Let's say this is h tilde, 
So it still there is somewhere else in the graph, and our treated graph is this. So this was our age. So we have dealt with the for loop graph, and uh, this um, is now somewhere else. So let's uh, change the ordering. So this is now age tilde 5 or age 5, which is uh, now our age tilde. So we change the order, and then this graph somewhere else in the big graph is treated later, and it is disjoint from the graph age that we have treated. And uh, then, of course, this intersection doesn't change. Good. And uh, then the intersection doesn't change, and the reduced graph, where we reduce the graph by shrinking this to a point, uh, this before and after contains this age in the same way. Therefore, uh, this node applies, and uh, going from uh, x prime to x, so treating this th integration, happens in the identical way to the full graph and for the reduced graph. That means it happens in the identical way for this graph and for that counter term graph. Treating h happens is independent of whether you have here a counter term or a one loop graph. This is the statement. And this is kind of obvious. So, okay, uh, let's just write it. And the operation g x prime going eventually to g with index a, b, or j uh, with x. It's the same for g over h tilde. It's the identical sequence of integrations with beta, uh, setting used to zero, convolution integrals, and so on. Therefore, uh, again, the left-hand side and right-hand side of this equation are treated in the same way. And lo and behold, we have proven that proposition D also holds at the next level for x prime replaced by x. And this now completely ends our proof. We have now managed to finish the inductive proof of the fundamental theorem of renormalization in dimensional regularization.